now that we're recorded, um, again, hello everybody. Welcome to the Neocortex Introductory Webinar. I'm Nick Nystrom. I'm Chief Scientist at PSC and part of the Neocortex Project. I'd just like to make a few preliminary statements as we get started. Um, first of all, this meeting will be recorded. It is being recorded and we'll be posting it to YouTube next week. So if you can't make it for the whole thing or if you have colleagues, please refer them. We're planning on about 40 minutes presentation followed by Q&A. If you have questions, please submit them to the Zoom chat. We're monitoring those during the webinar and we'll be answering those in a combination of Zoom chat, some live, and for those we can't get to today, we'll be following up and answering them online on the Neocortex website. Uh, please participate. We'll be having several polls during the webinar to get feedback on what you're interested in and how we can help you. Um, because this is an EXCEED webinar, EXCEED is a National Science Foundation virtual organization overseeing our cyber infrastructure. We ask that you abide by the EXCEED code of conduct. conduct. And the, it's common sense. It says this is inclusive, uh, no harassment policy, and welcoming to everybody, uh, really embracing diversity inclusion as we do in our Neocortex project. So please take a moment to read this and take note. And with that, I would like to introduce our Neocortex principal investigator, Paola Burichago, who will begin this presentation. Thank you, Nick. Can you hear me well? Very well. Well, thank you all uh, for joining this webinar. As Nick has mentioned, we are going to be talking about Neocortex, which, which is an NSF-funded upcoming supercomputer. Uh, the content today will be delivered in cooperation or in collaboration with Nick. We'll be talking about the infrastructure part in uh, detail. So let's get started. Uh, this is our outline. Uh, we are going to have an introduction where uh, we will be talking about the context or what's the environment in which uh, Neocortex was designed and envisioned. Then we will be talking about a little bit also the motivation, why Neocortex and, and where do we see Neocortex helping uh, our research community. Then we will be talking about uh, introducing in more detail what Neocortex is uh, and then what are the kind of applications we expect to target and, and then, as I mentioned, Nick will be uh, doing a deeper dive on the system architecture. Uh, next, we will be talking about the early user program, which is the way in which uh, each and all of you can uh, be part of this project and help us make uh, this a great success. Later on, we will have a summary and we will be opening uh, ideally a 20 minute period of time for Q and A. So introduction, uh, I would like to start by setting a little bit of the context. Neocortex is a project that was proposed in response to the NSF solicitation 19507. Uh, the number is not necessarily that uh, important. What I would like to highlight here is that uh, normally when we are talking about the cyber infrastructure um, landscape that is funded by NSF, we tend to take off we tend to think of systems that are normally described as capacity systems, which are production ready systems that are uh, expected to serve the national open science community. Now, starting last year in 2019, uh, NSF started uh, calling or requesting a type of system that is mm, uh, referred to as category two and refers to innovative prototypes or testbeds. And these systems are, uh, are aimed to capture forward-looking capabilities that, as the text says in the bottom, uh, deploys novel technologies, architectures, usage, usage models, and also targets the exploration of new applications, algorithms, or paradigms. All of these uh, in the aims of fostering scientific uh, discovery in science and engineering. So, uh, neocortex is a category two type of system. Of these systems, there are or they have been awarded only three so far. Um, one last year, Ukami, and then uh, SDSC, Voyager this year, and then Neocortex, which will be delivered by the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. So this is a new category of system. It's more flexible, it's more exploratory, and um, 
it, it's all about um, exploring new venues or approaches to make science happen. So neocortex was awarded earlier this year as uh, in the same way that Bridges, Bridges AI and Bridges 2, Neocortex uh, is NSF funded, is once again a category two system, and is delivered in collaboration with uh, Cerebras and Hewlett Packard Enterprise. We will go into more detail to describe how this collaboration works. Certainly they are providing um, parts of the supercomputing, but also uh, we are collaborating to make sure the system satisfies satisfy the needs of our user base. In this slide, what I would like to present is what are the three main goals or overarching goals of the project Neocortex. Uh, the first goal is to deploy the supercomputer. We are planning to do that this year uh, around late summer or fall, early fall. And then with deploying the system, what we uh, aim to do is we aim to bring uh, or offer to the national open science community hardware technology that is going to uh, accelerate AI training, that is going to enable uh, researchers and students um, and faculty and whatnot to uh, explore um, AI without uh, the boundaries that maybe they currently have by not having access to uh, advanced computing powers and memory and, and data uh, movement or fast data movement. So that's the main, one of the main goals. The second one is that this is uh, a project that is expected to last five years, during which we will be exploring uh, how a neocortex can better serve our community. And we will be offering support and operating neocortex. Third and very important goal for this project, we will be engaging a wider, a wide audience uh, in our open science community, and we will foster in adoption all of these via outreach, training, and content and knowledge dissemination. So now let's jump a little bit uh, to the motivation. Many of you, I presume, might be familiar with this graph. Uh, this is a, re a study done by OpenAI published uh, last year, that's when we deploy uh, or when we can uh, copy this graph, it has been around and has been constantly updated. But what it shows and what we have here on this graph, each of these points is an AI model. And in the vertical axis, what we have is uh, uh, the number of petaflops days that are required to train this model. So we see uh, they tend to be, or these models are the state of the art, uh, models in different uh, times uh, over the years. So what we can see or what is interesting to highlight from here is that from 1960 until uh, a little bit past 2010, more exactly 2012, we see that there is a, a line that has a certain uh, inclination that closely tracks uh, Moore's law. So in a way we were seeing that the uh, most demanding uh, artificial intelligence models were uh, requiring compute that was doubling every two years. Now in 2012, uh, we started seeing how all these uh, very interesting uh, deep learning models, uh, the compute required to train them started doubling every 3.4 months. So that clearly calls uh, for a different approach to satisfying this compute or ever growing uh, hunger for compute uh, another example of how we see that artificial intelligence is just uh, growing and growing uh, in terms of complexity and the type, in terms of the hardware specifications that are needed to enable it uh, are on the left. Uh, we have models that are used for image classification. In particular, we are talking about um, image classification with ImageNet vertical axis. We are talking about top five accuracy. Each of the circles represents the size of the model. So where we have models that uh, use one million parameters and up to a few hundred million parameters. We can see also on the uh, horizontal axis, the number of operations required to execute just one forward pass. And there is a clear correlation in terms of the compute required to train them and the accuracy that they deliver. This is 
on the left when we talk about computer vision. On the right, we can see some transformant type of networks that are normally used in natural language processing. And once again, when we look at the columns uh, that we label as parameters, we can see how the number of parameters just have, uh, uh, there's a growing tendency. So for a few hundreds of millions, which is in itself a very large uh, model, now we see that we have a few hundred billions uh, with GPT-3, which was published uh, last month this year. So if we look at the models in isolation, we see there is a growing demand for larger memory, more compute to be able to train them. Uh, now, if we consider additional sources of, of complexity, uh, because when you are training or doing research in deep learning, you don't just have data trained and then you're ready to go. Uh, there are different approaches like generative adversarial uh, learning, domain adaptation, reinforcement learning that by default relied in an iterative approach where you train multiple times before you reach a final version of your model. So we are talking about very complex model that you have to constantly train. Uh, on top of that, and well, these kind of reiterates that need. Normally with machine learning workflows, uh, you just have so many stages or steps that you need to uh, involve when you're training your model. It's not only just train and go, uh, there is a pre-processing step that tends to be very time consuming and effort consuming in terms of uh, the talent that is developing these models. So you have raw data, you have to do pre-processing, then when you have the data and in a, a clean uh, curated form, then you can explore training, but then training actually has different steps. And then once you train one time, you have to go back again many times, either because you got new data or because you're doing some hyperparameter optimization or you're doing uh, network architecture search. So many uh, reasons why you might need to go around. And so this just is, goes to say uh, the need for compute uh, that would allow to advance research enabled by AI is definitely there and it's just growing and increasing over time. Now, um, just to reiterate the, the, this sentence, there is this uh, paper published by Jan LeCun, one of the most popular researchers in the AI landscape and creator of the CNNs. He last year put together a paper called Past, Present and Future of Deep Learning Harvard. Uh, the, uh, we have the, the link here, well, not the link, but you can find it and I recommend you read it if you're interested in seeing how Harvard uh, motivates and limits the type of ideas that, that, is, that are explored by AI researchers. Uh, it's just a reality and that's what happened in 2012 when a new approach to hardware and also a combination of having the data and uh, also and the algorithms. Uh, in 2012 when new hardware was enabled and for or used for artificial intelligence models that had been developed uh, decades ago were now possible to implement, it was now possible to implement them and then the revolution of artificial intelligence started. So what we are aiming here is to continue that revolution and maybe sort of uh, enabling a second wave. Now uh, the first uh, quote what mentions is that how hardware limits what is explored. Also uh, the second uh, quote just goes to say that uh, in deep learning uh, when we are talking about supervised learning the tendency is to use larger and larger models. Now, an area of uh, deep learning or machine learning that uh, is being explored, but is not as mature as, the, as supervised learning is uh, what we would prefer to unsupervised learning or self-supervised, weekly supervised or multitask learning. Those are areas that are slightly more complex where definitely larger networks would be needed to produce good results. So. That's the current landscape that we have in AI uh, research or research enabled by AI. And that's what motivated uh, Neocortex. Now, um, just to make it more explicit, who did we design the system for? Certainly people doing demanding deep learning training, people that are already hitting the limits of the current systems available at the time. And uh, also considering that the way Neocortex is going to be deployed, we are considering or are targeting users that have scientific workflows that uh, in which one part is deep learning uh, models or they have a stage that is deep learning, but also might be doing um, 
simulations where deep learning can come in the form of surrogate model. So considering neocortex is going to be integrated with Bridges 2, uh, ideal candidates or users for this new system would be users that have complementary uh, parts of the workflow uh, leveraging Bridges 2 resources. So some examples include um, computer vision using for medical, um, medical research. So uh, research done with large sets of large large sets of medical images and applications where uh, the resolution of um, these medical images is needed to produce good results. We also can consider uh, challenging training in astrophysics, weather, genomics, or other science. So all these applications that currently might be bounded by memory at the time, or might be bounded by just the length that it takes to train. Uh, those are what we are aiming for. And as I mentioned, uh, workflows that include simulation runs and where uh, deep learning models could potentially be used as surrogate models. Uh, or type of models that would fit uh, this kind of uh, supercomputer that we're bringing are models that are dynamic or models with separable convolutions, uh, models where sparsity is um, uh, induced in particular, and Nick will talk about that in a little bit more detail, this uh, system that we are deploying is uh, excellent at exploiting sparsity that is very um, present in deep learning uh, models at the time, and is uh, exploited in a very interesting way in which uh, you don't perform operations, you don't waste energy and time uh, computing um, in, or upgrades or gradients where you have zeros. Our type of models that we are targeting are graph neural networks, uh, models with sparse attention, sequential models, and uh, the last one, which is very important, models that would benefit, and maybe not only benefit, but models that demand model parallelism to be trained. So with that in mind, we are introducing Neocortex. Uh, this is, again, a system that is designed to accelerate scientific discovery. Our target is to shortened by several orders of magnitude, the time required for uh, demanding deep learning training. Our target is to make it as close as interactive as possible. We certainly understand how the cycle of, from the deciding an experiment up to the moment that you get results and then you iterate, that drives uh, the speed at which you can produce results and uh, is a current limitation for many of our users. Uh, we also want to foster integration of artificial deep learning with scientific workflows. As I mentioned, a new cortex will be integrated with Bridges 2 and want to leverage that part. And then we will be providing this revolutionary new hardware that uh, will uh, hopefully enable the design of new algorithms and networks altogether by breaking some of the boundaries that currently exist regarding hardware. This system is offered at no cost, so it's completely uh, free of charge to anybody that uh, falls under this uh, category of national open science community. So if you're a student uh, or you're a researcher affiliated with, a, with an academic um, institution, uh, you most likely will be able to have an access uh, free of charge to the system, which is uh, very, revolutionizing in the way that we will be democratizing access to revolutionizing or very uh, uh, powerful compute for artificial intelligence. Now, there is this disclaimer that potential users that are interested in this system and don't necessarily follow under this class, uh, there is also a way we can get uh, or explore working together and we will have to um, handle it on a case by case basis. So I encourage you to get in contact if you're interested in getting access to the system and don't necessarily follow on the open science category. So Neocortex, as you guys might have uh, imagined, was inspired, the name was inspired by the, uh, this great part of our brain that is um, <clears throat> known to have evolved more recently and is involved uh, with the processing of sensory data, including visual data, audio data, and also with, uh, the, with uh, decisions such as uh, movement in our body. So we are uh, aiming uh, and 
hoping that with our system we will be enabled uh, something similar to what the, this part of our brain does, which takes a lot of sensory data and helps make decisions and produce uh, great results in a specific machine learning task. So now let's go and talk a little bit more about the resource specification. And here I would like to handle to Nick. Uh, Nick, please take it from here. Okay, thank you, Paula. Um, so I hope everybody's been excited about what they've heard on the why Cerebrus and Neocortex are what they are. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'd like to tell you a bit about the hardware. So we designed this in collaboration with Cerebrus Systems and Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And you may have seen a lot of press that's been out since last fall about the Cerebrus CS1 and the wafer scale engine being the most powerful AI system on the planet. And it is. So when we were designing Neocortex, we were thinking about what can we do that would make it even better? And the answer is that no matter how great the system is, it's never big enough to do everything you could ever imagine. So we wanted to be able to explore scaling it beyond one CS1 to more than one. And so two is the right number to begin. We also wanted to exploit what we know about high performance computing architecture to be able to drive these at extremely high speed, either independently, each CS1 independently, or together, um, using them both at once, again, at full speed. So we did that with an HPE Superdome Flex. This is a very large shared memory server that builds on experience we have at PSC. And we've been working with HP Labs to design it to be balanced with the two CS1s. So that's the compute nodes. It's two CS1s and the Superdome. We'll get into more detail about each of those in a moment. The interconnect is 100 gigabit Ethernet links. And between each Superdome Flex and the Superdome, there are 12 of these. So 1.2 terabits to each CS1. That's 150 gigabytes per second. Um, really phenomenal connectivity. And then we pair that with eight HDR200 links to Bridges 2. Now Bridges 2 is the other supercomputer we're deploying this year. And so I'm PI of that, Paula's co-PI of it, and Sergio who's in the audience is also a co-PI of that project. The point here is that Bridges 2 provides additional storage, 15 petabytes of disk, tremendous amounts of general purpose computing, traditional machine learning. And so it gives a complete ecosystem for this amazing deep learning training environment that is Neocortex. The storage, can you back up one slide, please? The storage is very rich. There's 205 terabytes of NVMe SSD within the Superdome Flex. That's local to Neocortex. There's 24 terabytes of RAM on that server as well. Um, that's the biggest system PSC has ever deployed. And that connects to roughly 15 petabytes on Lustre on Bridges for storing really large data. Next slide, please. So the CS1 server is shown in this um, CAD cutaway view. Um, it's a 15 rack unit high server. So about half a, rack, half a normal rack, roughly, maybe a third. Um, it's impressive. It has very extensive water cooling to keep this processor at operating temperatures. The processor is shown on the right. Um, for those not familiar with American baseball, that's a baseball. It's about the size you can fit in your hand comfortably. And so the processor is essentially as large as you can make on a silicon wafer. And that's what we're looking at here. That's why it's called the wafer scale engine. Now the vision Cerebrus had was by designing a processor specifically for sparsity and the operations we need to do for deep learning training and some other things, you can really optimize the operations. You can avoid doing very expensive multiplies by zero that dominate most of the operations on competing architectures. And you can focus the floating point operations onto only operations that you need to do to get a result. The interconnect on the, on the on the wafer is also reconfigurable. 
that reconfigurability is essential because you have to get the yield up on this whole wafer scale processor and being able to reconfigure around any defect in the silicon is essential to get essentially, to get close to 100% yield on these wafers. And the last thing is the memory is on board. So this next slide, yep, thank you for moving me along. <laughs> next slide is an image. This is actually from a while ago in Los Gatos at the Cerebris facility in California. And these are two of the systems. Um, the engineering is just, I would say exquisite. Um, the cooling is, as I said, it's a dual loop cooling system. There's one enclosed loop, and then that connects to a separate external chilled water loop. And that's needed because these processors can run up to about 20 kilowatts. And so that's a lot of cooling to handle. We have the left view on the, I'm sorry, the front view on the left, the back view on the right, and these can be connected. Um, the 12 gigabit, 12 times 100 gigabit ethernets are what come out the back and will go into the Superdome. In Neocortex at PSC, this will be a two rack system, the Cerebrus in one rack, um, and then the Superdome Flex next door. Argon had deployed one of these before the Supercomputing Conference last November. And they received, as far as I know, the first one that was publicly announced. Uh, this is led by Rick Stevens, who you may know from doing very impressive work in cancer research and other fields. And so they were a very early adopter of this. They've been working closely with Cerebrus. There's been also a system deployed at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Um, as far as I know, PSC is the first to receive a system that will contain two of these operating together. And that's really exciting for the open research community. Next slide, please. So I'd like to speak a little bit about the wafer scale engine or WSE. It's the largest chip ever built. It's over 46,000 square millimeters of silicon and 1.2 trillion transistors. For comparison, if you read about modern high-end CPUs and GPUs, they are typically in the billions of transistors. Um, so this is on the order of a thousand times bigger, at least a hundred times bigger than the very biggest things being built now. It has 400,000 AI optimized cores. Now these are the cores that are optimized to be able to do sparse arithmetic on tensor operations. Amanda, can you mute everybody please? Thank you. Now, something very significant about this processor is that it contains 18 gigabytes of SRAM. Um, for those familiar with computer engineering, SRAM is static RAM. It's exceedingly fast. It's also exceedingly expensive. That's why you don't find it on normal processors except in the very tiny caches. But on the wafer scale engine, we have 18 gigabytes of SRAM. On typical processors, that is in the kilobytes. Um, here we have gigabytes. So again, a factor of hundreds of thousands bigger. And what that means is that because it's distributed across the wafer scale engine, the SRAM is also accessible in only one clock cycle from the cores. Compare that to L1 cache on normal processors, that's typically a few clock cycles. So what that means is very fast to get this sparse data into the processors. And the bandwidth of that SRAM is nine petabytes per second of memory bandwidth. Again, if you want to compare that to modern high-end CPUs as we're deploying in Bridges 2, um, they're fantastic, but they're on the order of 200 gigabytes per second. And between gigabytes, you have terabytes. And so we have many orders of magnitude difference in the memory bandwidth. And the final piece of this is the fabric bandwidth. Now the fabric is the interconnect that is actually on the wafer seal engine that's moving data around the die. And that number is 100 petabits. It's, that's just mind boggling. In doing a lot of HPC over a long time of PSC, I haven't seen numbers anywhere like this. And so that's what we learned about Cerebrus. We became very excited by this chip and its potential. I think in my history of building high performance computing systems, this is the single most transformative step that has been taken. And I think 
the, the exploration we're doing for deep learning with neocortex and Cerebrus and HP labs, I think it may set the tone for other architectural trends to come. So the system IO on this, on the, on the unit, the CS1, is 1.2 terabyte, terabits, so 12 times 100 gigabits per second. The power is 20 kilowatts. And what's really exciting here is in just the frameworks we all know and love, TensorFlow and PyTorch. So that makes it easy to use despite the exotic hardware that is under the hood. Next slide, please. The wafer scale engine is a fully programmable system that is handled internally by the Cerebra software and compiler stack. So this makes it transparent to the users. These are what ingest the models that are expressed in TensorFlow or PyTorch. And behind the scenes, there's a graph compiler that decomposes the, the logic into something that maps onto the silicon. And at the lowest level, it actually looks like a place and route that you would do for mapping out transistors on a die or an FPGA. And it does the layout on the die on the different logical units to be able to execute at very high efficiency. There's a full array of general instructions with specific machine learning instructions for tensor operations, for control processing, and the data flow architecture and harvesting sparsity. Now this is really key. You hear a lot about pruning models in deep learning and that means being able to get rid of a lot of the zero weights. There's a lot you can do ahead of time too and while it's running. And that's what the overall software and hardware architecture that Cerebrus is providing does. These, next slide was fine, thank you. Um, what I wanna say is that these frameworks run in containers that are closely orchestrating the workflow between the host processor, in this case, the Superdome Flex, and the Cerebrus wafer scale engines. And they're what do the data movement, rather than having to host the whole data set in the accelerator RAM, like you would do on a GPU with HBM2 memory there, data is instead streamed from the Superdome Flex to the wafer scale, I'm sorry, yes, to the wafer scale engine. And that is why we actually have those 12 very high bandwidth links going in that direction. So going back to the wafer scale engine itself, now this is a, a high level diagram of the way the memory is really across the whole processor and distributed across the processor, well, let's say, let's just get at the SRAM in only one clock, that's essential. Using small batches of batch size one, lets the system run at very, very high efficiency. And it lets you scale without doing big batch sizes. So for those that have worked on tuning batch sizes to optimize efficiency on GPUs, this is designed to avoid that. It's designed to make deep learning interactive to maximize product, programmer productivity. And it's just a new way of thinking about things. Next slide, please. The fabric is what we talked about. In this, this is a very microscopic view into that die of processors and the fabric connections as these reddish orange lines between them. The advantage of connecting this way is that there's no bottleneck. Everything is very densely connected. There's no synchronization problem. Everything just flows at this 100 petabits per second. And we can train it to small batch sizes. Next slide. I want to say just a few words about the Superdome Flex. So this is probably the world's biggest front end. Um, for those who remember other super reviews, the front end was this little node used to talk to the really big thing. In this case, our front end is a fully a supercomputer in its own right. It is 32 high-end Intel Xeon sockets, 24 terabytes of RAM, about four and a half terabytes per second of memory bandwidth. It's, it is a monster in itself, and the point is that this is fully provisioned to serve the CS1 units at full speed. Internally, there is a crossbar topology. For those that don't know, the, uh, this was called a, a NUMA or non-uniform memory access shared memory server. It means that every core, every processor can get at all 24 terabytes of RAM in the full system. And that's essential to be able to scale this training up. It means that as a user, you don't have to break up the training set across many different nodes and distribute that 
and then worry about how do you get those off to the deep learning engine, the whole model can just rely, reside on the Superdome Flex and be farmed off to the Cerebrus at full speed. Next slide, please. So um, this is just more detail on what the Superdome Flex is. It's really enable, enabling ease of use, high performance, and internally, it also has a lot of internal NVMe SSDs, about 205 terabytes. These we see as caching local data sets for the neocortex at the beginning. And then later, inter interfacing this through the HPE Data Management Framework, or DMF, to be able to transparently cache data that comes from Bridges 2 to neocortex, and to be able to serve many projects at once, many users, and really to enable throughput across the open science community. Next slide, please. Um, the diagram of the system is fairly simple. Um, Bridges 2 is on the bottom. I know you can't see my cursor, but it's a big system. It's over 70,000 cores, over five petaflops, a lot of disk, 192 Volta 32 gigabyte GPUs for those who want those for other deep learning training and for other purposes. Then that connects at 1.6 terabits per second to the Superdome Flex. Over that link, data is cached to the Superdome Flex for doing training iterations. That then goes through a 3 gigabit switch to the super, I'm sorry, to the Cerebrus CS1s. And as we've said, each one of these is independently, up until Neocortex, the greatest training system in the world. Now we have two of them, and we'd really like to explore training across them as well. Next slide, please. Paula, would you like to resume here? Uh, either way, I. So, <clears throat> as Nick mentioned, thank you, Nick. As Nick mentioned, uh, one of the great things about this new system is that uh, it's um, available to be used uh, through the frameworks that some of the frameworks that are the most popular ones, uh, that is TensorFlow 2 and PyTorch. So, we will be expecting uh, that to be supported from day one the transition from uh, or the code changes that need to be done in order to exploit and optimize uh, your application for this uh, for the CS1 will be minimal and uh, for that we will be offering uh, comprehensive support. Now uh, there is also uh, the option to create your own kernels and applications by uh, computing Sorry about coding on a low level programmable C interface that is called layer. Uh, so, what we see here is uh, it's going to be extremely useful from day one. Now, the element that we have here with the CS1 is that uh, there is a Cerebrus graph compiler. And this is how the application is executed or what happens before it is executed. You define your model and your training using popular frameworks, there is a matching to a kernel graph um, that are optimized and know exactly how to place the application on the no, on the chip, well, on the walker, uh, in such a way that is uh, exploits the sparsity and exploits uh, the correct execution of the model. With that, uh, we will be concluding the system architecture part of the talk. And I'm going to go and then talk about the early user program, which is the way in which uh, we expect those of you who have uh, an application that would benefit from Neocortex to join us. We did have a poll a moment ago that asked explicitly that how many of you have an application that you consider would benefit from Neocortex. I saw uh, a great portion of you uh, answered yes uh, to that question, and we will be uh, more than happy to hear more about your, uh, what you're working on and how can we work together. So uh, the goal of the early user program is to achieve scientific progress. Uh, we would like to um, enable that for you. Uh, certainly the early user program is gonna work under the, under the same terms and conditions of the whole system, which is uh, you can get access to the system at no charge at all. Uh, for the early user program, we will be having a user guide uh, frontline support and advanced support from day zero. So uh, there will be support from uh, train 
and PSC user support uh, uh, experts, and also certainly from Cerebras and HP. Now, uh, we are expected there the user program to take place in the fall. So we are targeting, um, and as we know, there are many moving pieces with the current uh, environment in which we are living, but our target, uh, if everything goes well, is uh, October. Um, we, are, we will be releasing more instructions on how to apply to this um, program to our webpage. So between the next week and the next one, we should be announcing the specific mechanism or process to uh, join us. And then just uh, so we, uh, you know what are the expectations, uh, our goal is to enable your applications. And in the process, we will ask in return that you provide some feedback. Uh, it can be in the form of surveys or just um, close um, communication with our experts. Now, once again, the goal here uh, is to produce scientific progress, enable that for you and uh, for the project. Now, I, I would like to make it a little bit more explicit what kind of applications or some examples of some of the applications that we would like to include in the early user program. If you're working on annotation based in color only or the color only model such as BERT or GPT-2 or GPT-3, uh, uh, please, uh, Contact us, uh, LSTM models, uh, LSTM based recurrent neural networks, and also graph convolution neural networks that are keep well in style uh, for graph level predictions. Those are also uh, ideal candidates for our system. So, absolutely, if you answer yes to a question, if you have an application that will benefit from Neocortex, please add. Uh, I mean, follow our web page and let us know or get in contact. You can also just send an email at this time and we'll follow up with you. Now, this, um, so we are all clear. This is our target timeline. This project started in June 1st. It's quite, it's very recent. Uh, since then, we have been um, preparing, doing preparatory activities, considering including system and user environment, definition of that, documentation, working on documentation and dissemination. Uh, inviting researchers for early user programs. So there are some of you who have um, been directly contacted because we are aware of applications that uh, you're doing that uh, would benefit from this. But uh, for those of you that are now listening or hearing about this model and want to join us again, please uh, uh, reach out. Now on July 20, we are expecting to uh, accept the applications for early user programs. So um, this more broad invitation to participate. Then uh, late summer 2020 is when we expect to have delivery installation and initial testing. And then in the fall is when we expect to advance our early user program and uh, hopefully conclude the acceptance or the official acceptance testing. <clears throat> we are close to the conclusion of the content of the webinar. Uh, we will be having additional webinars in particular we have one uh we're planning one for uh late august where we will be diving deeper into the cs1 and how it benefits a specific type of networks or deep learning networks we will be have a per 20 plenary on july 29 uh please and join us to learn more about not only neocortex but the other new and funded systems and um once again, we will be releasing more information on the early user program, and that will be officially released on our Neocortex website. The website is definitely the, uh, uh, the official way to get more updates on our system. And any additional questions, inputs, or requests, do not hesitate to contact us at neocortex.psc.edu. Now, I see there is a typo there, so I'll fix that. And when we share the slides, uh, they all will be there. Now, as a summary, we are very excited to deliver this new advanced computing system that is capturing uh, incredible AI hardware technology that once again is bound to transform or promises to transform the AI-enabled research landscape. Uh, it's going to be available late this year at no cost for those doing open science. Uh, it incorporates two Cerebras CS1 systems very high, or extremely revolutionizing, groundbreaking hardware technology. And then one HP Super Flex with 24 terabytes of RAM. 
And uh, I want to highlight here also that one of our main goals uh, here in this project is to engage a strong community around the new technology. So you will be hearing more from us uh, as we will be focusing strongly on outreach, training, and user support. Now, and I would like to conclude with uh, repeating again that if you have an application and you're interested in participating in this project, uh, please follow uh, the project website or just send us an email right now saying that you uh, are interested and we will follow up. I would like to conclude with uh, extending our gratitude to all those contributing to this project. So uh, NSF, thing, uh, we appreciate uh, the vote of trust to explore these um, great promising technologies, uh, our partners, Cerulus and Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and then uh, absolutely our team at PSC who are making this project possible. Thank you. And with that, I would like to open the Q&A section of the webinar. Okay, so Paula, thank you. Uh, this is Nick again. I'd like to We've been monitoring the questions in real time. Um, some I know have been answered in chat. And I would like to read from a few of them in the remaining 12 minutes and, and get them answered. Those we don't have time to answer in this session, uh, we will follow up. We'll be posting the answers on the Neocortex website. So if you don't hear yours addressed, um, we haven't ignored you, please just check back. We'll be sure to send that link as well. So the first, I've tried to group these as well as, as we have as well as we can. So first of all, um, the first question, I'm sure it had many upvotes on Slido. How much, and this is from Paula, how much does it cost to access Neocortex and is there help for people who are getting started? Sure, absolutely. Um, well, as, as it has been mentioned during the webinar, access to Neocortex is at absolutely no cost for those um whose work can be classified as open science for uh, those interested that don't fit that specific class we would need you to send an email to our address and then we will explore or we will uh, get back to you with more information on venues through which we could possibly enable access to neocortex now for those that participate in our early user program, there will be uh, plenty of support and we are very interested in making sure uh, your application properly runs in Neocortex and runs efficiently. So we will be working closely with um, experts here at PSC and also Cerebras and eventually a larger uh, support uh, team of experts. Okay, thank you. Now, I know you spoke to that some to some extent in the presentation, but there's a question that also was upvoted. What are the characteristics of deep learning tasks that should be run on neocortex rather than on bridges or bridges too? So um, in general terms, it, uh, it would be those deep learning applications that are currently hitting limits. So if uh, there is research that you want to advance and you are needing to kind of uh, bound within what you can do with what we currently offer on Bridges, uh, which includes uh, the DBX2 and also all the other uh, nodes um, and voltage GPUs that we offer within Bridges, what we refer to as Bridges AI. Uh, if there's research that you're currently uh, are bounding to what fits there and you would like to explore um, additional um, spaces in the hyperparameter uh, or additional areas in the hyperparameter space or you want to explore um, larger uh, models or uh, more complex models or more possibly dynamic uh, models that's definitely uh, an indication that you should be considering uh, neocortex or preparing to exploit neocortex Additionally, if you have, um, on top of that, if you have networks that are particularly sparse or that fit the description that we have given in terms of um, being uh, like uh, in color or out of color only type of networks like BERT and GPT uh, two or three, um, those are candidates 
definitely for this system. Okay, great. Um, and I'll just say, if you, if you have things that you would like to run, let us know and we will let you know where the roadmaps are and where they can fit. Absolutely. And I, I would like to say that in general, if you have questions, like you're not completely sure, then we can also just follow up and mm -hmm. explore your specific application. And uh, to start with, help you answer whether or not it's a good candidate for Neocortex. Yes, so thank you. So there were four questions that all have similar feel and I've grouped them. And I'm going to summarize them. There are four questions and I'll volunteer to take these just to break it up. And they have to do with, can you run hybrid HPC and AI applications using Neocortex? And can you run things other than deep learning on Neocortex? So I'll try to answer those at once. So certainly one of the things we've always been advocating at PSC is heterogeneous architectures to be able to run these converged HPC and AI workloads. So with Bridges 2 and Neocortex, absolutely. Um, you can do the hybrid HPC and AI applications, for example, running CFD on Bridges and then using Neocortex for doing high performance training to develop um, surrogate models and so forth. Now, I know that there is some work being done to also be able to do HPC type things on the Cerebrus CS1. Um, initially, Neocortex is targeting AI, but we'll also be interested to hear in what other things people might want to do and see if there might be a fit. So I hope that helps. Uh, feel free to follow up with us and we'd be happy to get into more details. So I now have a couple questions I've grouped that I'd like to pose to Sergio, who is our co-PI and Associate Director for User Support. Um, Sergio, there are questions about if the system will be available to the general research community, how to get access. And into this, I will also group questions about deeper training and documentation, such as we'll do through our next training sessions. Uh, okay, thanks, Nick. Um, uh, thanks everyone for attending and asking these fabulous questions. Um, and uh, the answer to uh, availability, the system will be available, as Paula said. Uh, there will be an early user program, and then uh, uh, there will be uh, allocations via the uh, Exceed uh, application process. Uh, regarding the ability to uh, to uh, build custom applications, I think as Paula said, there is an initial uh, set of uh, APIs basically and uh, uh, interfaces that uh, will be available from day one. Uh, at some point, we do plan to introduce to make a, a, a software development uh, kit available. Uh, and uh, as was said before, I think the key really is to understand for you to contact us and tell us what you want to do. And we will, you know, work with you to, uh, you know, help you do what you want to do as soon as possible. Uh, enlisting our, you know, partners at Cerebra. So we have, as was said, we have the ability to maybe get into, you know, accelerate some uh, processes uh, with the vendor. Uh, because we're, this is actually a, you know, close partnership between uh, BSC, HPE, and uh, Cerebras. So uh, just let us know what you want to do, and we'll we'll make it happen. Uh, so uh, uh, in terms of the uh, early user program, uh, as Paula said, uh, the process will be announced soon. In terms of what we will uh, want uh, from uh, what people to tell us is basically, you know, what progress would they like to achieve specifically during the 30 days of the early user program, which will be part of the acceptance testing. Um, and uh, just, you know, what prerequisites they need, such as data. Again, what do they, what, what do you want to do? So we'll set up a process to ask you these questions and then to 
uh, uh, stage in um, um, projects uh, according to that. Okay, thank you, Sergio. Um, we also had some very good technical questions. And for these, I would actually like to defer to our colleague at Cerebris, Natalia Veseleva. And there are two questions, Natalia, I'd like to send your way. Um, one is someone who points out that a lot of graph analytic applications can involve very large data sets. And how does the Cerebris CS1 and Neocortex handle that? The second is actually several questions where people are asking about how is performance looking compared to other systems and in general? Of course, we recognize that the system is young and growing, but what can you say? Thank you, Mink, and hello, everybody. So first on uh, graph algorithms. Um, yes, you're right that uh, there are multiple um, algorithms on graph which uh, require that the whole graph uh, being kept in memory. But we believe that Neocortex is also uniquely positioned to run on to try uh, some new algorithms with that because you will have uh, vast uh, memory capacity on Superdome Flex system. So it will be possible to keep the whole graph. We have 24 terabytes of memory uh, in, in memory of that system and maybe run some traditional algorithms on that. And um, then maybe sample some subgraphs for uh, as training samples if you would like to run something like graph convolutional neural networks on CS1. And uh, for graph convolutional neural networks, uh, CS1 is a really good fit because for most of those uh, operations, or there are, there are a significant subset of operations which happens on adjacency matrices, which are typically sparse for those graphs. So we see um, some interesting results when we run, uh, as of today, we run uh, graph level prediction tasks on CS1 system when graphs are not as big, but they have very large number of graphs. So an example application will be something like drug discovery, when every graph uh, represents a compound and you need to predict some properties of that. So for these smaller graphs and uh, graph level prediction tasks, we run them today on the system and see some interesting results. Because again, uh, our advantage of dealing with uh, sparse linear algebra operations and uh, we have some ideas how we can tackle uh, other kind of uh, node level tasks on very large graphs, but uh, it will be very interesting to collaborate on those and to see what can be done on a neocortex system as opposed to just CS1. And uh, the second question was uh, regarding the performance. Uh, so we see orders of magnitude speed up on different workloads which we run today on CS1. Uh, so typically we work with the Oh, so, so far we've been working with uh, several customers, uh, probably, probably the one which uh, we uh, talk publicly about is Argonne National Lab. So their researchers uh, use uh, the system actively today. So we also deployed recently in system uh, into Livermore National Lab and we have a few commercial customers. I can't talk about their uh, applications or names of those customers due to confidentiality. Uh, they don't use uh, typically stock networks and uh, we are mostly focused on supporting them in their applications. So they typically use the same type of layers. So we run attention-based networks, we run different fully connected neural networks, so one the convolutional neural networks and, and many others, but they are not uh, the models which have names from, from papers. And on those models, we see uh, orders of magnitude speed up compared to uh, existing setup with the and there are single V100, many of them run distributed, but small scale distributed uh, setups like within a single system. Natalia? Answers. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I, I don't mean to cut off the questions. There are many, many more good questions that we will answer on the Neocortex website, but we are at the top of the hour. So we'd like to respect everybody's time and thank you for attending. Um, Paula, do you have any closing remarks? Well, thank you all for attending the webinar. Thank you, Nick, Sergio, Natalia, and all of those that are making Neocortex possible. We will make sure to follow up with all questions and also uh, publish on our project website the results of the polls. I think it's interesting for everybody to see uh, where this audience stands regarding some of these questions. So thank you all, and we look forward to working uh, with those of you who would benefit from this and great system. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great afternoon.